So drawing on over three decades of experience and sharing some lessons that will hopefully provide valuable advice to anyone looking to start a company. Since 1987, David has hired hundreds of outstanding people, knowing that if he paid well, listened to, that valuable idea, to their valuable ideas and ensured that they loved coming to work every day, he could still be part of something great, even if he is the dumbest guy at the table, which I <laughs> significantly doubt, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. These basic principles have formed the basis of David's management style for over 30 years. So much has changed from a technology perspective, yet in some ways nothing's changed. Products come and go, but you'll always have customers, staff and business partners. How you treat these constituents will be different between building a company, a great company, an irrelevant company, or one that simply disappears. Um, I read David's book and I'd strongly encourage any of you who are interested in this topic to go out and, and buy a copy because it's for a great cause, but more importantly, there's just a, it's just really accessible. The, the nuggets of wisdom and advice in there are really, really accessible. I've scribbled all over my copy and you know that's usually a good sign. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce David Shane to you all today. Um, David's going to spend sort of 10 or 15 minutes kind of sharing his story and then I'll switch on my pocket mic here and, and ask him some questions and then we'll open it up to all of you and you can, you can kind of um, ask any questions or, or um, you know, get his feedback as well. So please join me in welcoming David Chen. Thank you. Very much. Thanks, uh, Kian, and uh, it's, it's actually fantastic to be talking to a proper audience. Um, <laughs> I'm so sick and bloody tired of Zoom and Teams meetings, and then it's great to be here in person. And uh, yeah, I, I I I wasn't sure if it maybe because I'm I'm old, but when you hear the Atlassian guy saying, you know, work from home forever, you know, Facebook, you know, never come back to the office. And I thought maybe it's just because I'm old that I just feel that the best way to build to build a culture and to work with people is is through human interaction. And I heard a great podcast recently. It was. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Andreessen Horowitz, and uh, it's, a, it's an awesome venture ca uh, capital fund in, uh, in the US. Mark Andreessen was you know, the guy who invented the browser. And, uh, and uh, Ben Horowitz was interviewing Reed Hastings. Reed Hastings is, is the CEO of Netflix, and Netflix are famous for their culture. I think they've published the 160-slide uh, PowerPoint presentation. And uh, so, so Ben Horowitz said to Reed Hastings, he said, so Reed, he said, what do you think of this word from work from home? He said, absolutely love it. He said, been doing it for the last 20 years, every night and every weekend. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I love that because I really do believe that it's, it's an unbelievable option and, and fantastic that you can do whatever you can do in the office, you can do you know, from anywhere. But to me, there's nothing that beats working as part of a team and being you know, working together with people. So I thought probably the best thing to do to kick off with was, was to actually explain how, how my book actually came about. And uh, I, I went, it was in August 2019, I, I, uh, I went with my wife, went to a, a health retreat up in Queensland, it's called Bungana. And in the morning you'd do, you'd do some exercise and activity and then there'd be a lecture on one day what to eat, the next day you'd do the same thing, you'd do some exercise and you know, what exercise you should be doing and they said in the afternoon they said just do nothing just do something that you'd never do back home so i'll go write a book <laughs> and uh i always sound embarrassed to say but proud to say that i've been using this, the same slide presentation for the last 35 years that it's all about people and relationships and that's what kian's introduction of me was in terms of your relationships with your customers your staff your business partners and it's really about culture it's really about how important culture is to any, to any organization. And, and I always say actually I go to the back page of a newspaper to, to keep that slide presentation uh, current. So if I, were, if I do my presentation today, I'd probably go and talk about Shane Warne. Okay. And, and actually if you look at what, you know, the thing that's come out about Shane Warne that's been so evident from every single article that I've read is that no matter whether you were Kerry Packer or a packer at, the, at, a, at a Woolworths, um, a Woolworths uh, 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 convenience store, he had time for everybody. And it's the way he related to people that really made him, that, that really, uh, in spite of his brilliance as a cricketer, and, you know, as ca charismatic as, as he was, maybe some of the flaws he had, everybody loves him and everybody thinks what an amazing 
human being he was because he treated everybody the same. And that's what I'd be saying if I was doing my slide presentation today. So I wrote my book based on that 35-year-old slide presentation, came back to Sydney and then reality set in and I thought, who the bloody hell would want to buy you know, some book that some has been who sold this company 21 years ago when you've seen the amazing success that Australia's had, you know, Canvas, Atlassians, Afterpays, put it in my top drawer, did absolutely nothing with it. Till about a year later, I was asked by a guy, Ian Gardner, who uh, um, also runs a, a venture capital fund called uh, Jellix, and but also does podcasts with um, much of anyone's listened to Innovation Bay. And uh, Ian asked me if I'd do a podcast, and uh, which I did, and it was about the only thing that I was able to talk about, which is people and company culture. And I got really, really good feedback. And, and sort of gave me a little inkling, I think maybe, uh, but still left in the top drawer until a, a really good friend of mine, a guy John McLean. John McLean was a really good rugby league player about 35 years ago. He played for Penrith in the, and there's probably some people in this room who re remember the Alexander Brothers going back many, many years. And, uh, and uh, in the off season, he was uh, training for a triathlon, got knocked off his bike by an eight ton truck, and was literally dead like eight times. He was brought back, brought, literally resuscitated, and uh, with a priest who read him uh, last rites. Anyway, obviously he's a wife, and uh, lands up in the Royal North Shore Hospital. Uh, one of four people, he says, I'm the only guy who can move my arms, and I think, how lucky am I? Six years later, John decided he wanted to go back to Nepean and do the triathlon that he'd been training for when he was, that he was, you know, when he was knocked off his bicycle and does that triathlon which was one kilometer swim, 30 kilometer bike ride like that, and then a, a 10 kilometer run in his wheelchair. That wasn't enough for John. He decided he wanted to become the first paraplegic to do the Hawaiian Ironman. And uh, you know, that's 3.8 kilometer swim, 180 kilometers, and then 42 kilometers in the wheelchair. And, uh, and I can tell you, I've been to watch that race and it's and it's excruciatingly hot, just watching the race was hard work. And John became the first paraplegic to complete that. And, uh, and then decided that wasn't enough, he wanted to become the first paraplegic to swim the English Channel. 32 kilometers, did that as well. And, uh, and then has done another, a, number of other, a number of other events like going to the 2000 Olympics and doing the Sydney to Hobart. And uh, so that on its own is, is an amazing story. Um, 27 years after being in a wheelchair, John actually taught himself to utilize the 10% of his spine that hadn't been severed, he actually started walking again. And actually the professor who admitted him at the Royal North Shore Hospital, Dr. Professor Yo, um, it's actually on 60 Minutes, said this is a miracle. You know, he said to John, you will never walk again. 27 years later, John is walking. The first time I saw him get out of his wheelchair, he staggered to the podium. And he said, I've got to stop drinking before I speak. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, why am I telling you this whole long story about John? Because he came to my house for a swim about a year ago, and uh, he had written a book called Change. It was how he had to change his life from being an able-bodied person to a special needs person. And I said, Johnny, I love the format of your book. I loved it. It was a book that was similar to this format. And I looked at the book and it had lots of diagrams. And because my book was based on a PowerPoint slide presentation, I had a lot of, a lot of diagrams in my book. I think that's why Kian was using it. He, he was coloring all the pictures. Yeah, was, yeah. So, and uh, and uh, I told John that I'd written this book. He said, Dave, you've got to promise me you're going to speak to the lady who helped me edit my book, and which I did. And, uh, and then, as I say, the rest is history. And the lady who asked me, um, who edit, helped me edit the book, actually said to me, um, you're going to have to dedicate this book to somebody. And uh, my wife thinking, yeah, thanks to my wonderful wife who I could never have achieved what I achieved without her amazing support, um, it wasn't going to be her who I dedicated the book to. I said, I'm dedicating it to a friend of mine, Dan Jarzen. Dan worked with me for about 10 years. Unfortunately, succumbed to mental illness, and uh, and he always <coughs> said to me, "Dave, you have to write a book." And I thought, 21 years later, I am going to write a book dedicated to Dan, and and 100% of the proceeds have been donated to the Black Dog, 
And by the way, my wife was ecstatic when I told her I was dedicating the book to Dan because everybody loved Dan. My whole family did, as, as did everybody. And uh, so that's pretty much the history of the book. And I think really what I have found out, you know, being you know, 60, 61 now, what I have absolutely realized is that, I'm going to start again, is that products come and go. You know, the products that put me on the map most of you would probably never have heard of. Novell was the company that put me on the map. Novell was the leading network operating system in the late 80s, early 90s, only to eventually get crushed by Microsoft. Synoptics was the first company that invest, in, invented Ethernet over unshielded twisted pair. And uh, yeah, then there were other companies like Cisco and Microsoft, etc. But yeah, what I have realized is that products come and go. What hasn't changed is every single company has customers, they have staff, they have business partners. And how you treat those three constituents is going to be the difference between building a good company, a great company, an irrelevant one, or one that simply disappears. And there are lots and lots of irrelevant companies. And I almost go so far as saying, I really believe that Microsoft is on their way to irrelevance. Yeah. Until Sachin Adela came on board, he turned that, you know, that massive company around on a, on a five cent coin and literally with the same products and people that company has become unbelievably relevant. So relevant means companies exist. You know, Blackberry still exists. Novell, I think, may even still exist. But if Black, the Blackberry network went down tomorrow, how many people in this room would say, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do? Okay. You want to be and you want to build an unbelievably relevant company. And, and the way you do that is, as I say, the way you treat your customers, the way you treat your staff, and the, and the relationships that you have with your business partners. So I might then hand over to you. Perfect. Thank you. Good segue. Can you give you a word? Can you grab a seat there? You can relax. Thank you. I've got a bunch of questions. I need a beer if I was going to relax. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm quite impressed that you, know, you gave your intro and you almost didn't mention the fact that you founded Australia's first tech uni uh, unicorn, nor our innovation fund. So we're going we're gonna to dive into both those topics now in a moment. But could you talk a little bit about the process of starting Comtech and, and just that journey a little bit? Because obviously we've got a whole bunch of people in the room who've started companies and they're so far away from a unicorn exit, but at the same time, so were you when you started. So could you just maybe kind of lay out that journey a little bit? So, so how I started, I think every company has a different reason for, for, for its existence. existence. Mine was, yeah, in the book, I say I could write a book on lucky breaks and the book would be that, you know, it would be a lot thicker than this book. There's so many things that happened in my life that if they had gone slightly different, um, taken slightly different paths, I wouldn't be sitting presenting here today. But probably one of the luckiest breaks I had, probably the luckiest, was my first job in Australia was a, a lousy job. I was, you know, paid badly, I was, got, I was getting $2,000 a month. Yeah, I, I hated going to work. I don't know if anyone's had a job where it feels like somebody's literally pushing you out the door to go to, the, to, go to work. And, and I had no say in what I did. My boss almost used to say, mate, leave your brain at the front door, pick it up on the way home. You know, my job's, my job's to think and your job's to do. And uh, yeah, if I had a decent job, I was a new migrant, I, I was, uh, had a wife and I had a young kid. And, uh, and the opportunity cost was so low starting a company, I thought for $2,000 a month, this is my opportunity to have a go. You know, I always say, my mother-in-law said to me, you, you go get a job like any normal South African. And uh, two years later, she said, why don't you give me any shares? So, <laughs> so mother-in-law was a four. But anyway, that's, um, so I, I guess that was, you know, I, I, I think had I been on a market-related salary, I was actually offered a job at $4,000 a month by a guy, Gary Butsworth. He was one of my customers and, uh, and I said to Gary, I said, Gary, the only reason I'm not taking the job is because, yeah, you know, I've always wanted to try something on my own, but if it doesn't work out, um, I won't be too proud to come back for a job in six months' time, and hopefully you won't be too proud to give me a job. And, uh, and you know, fortunately, I never had to go back um, for that job. The title of your book is really interesting. You know, the dumbest guy at the table, and, and you know that was before I met you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Just move slightly away from the table. In the book, you talk about the fact that 
you're, you're not a, a technologist, or you certainly weren't back then. Yep. So you know, to to found a company that becomes a, a technology unicorn when you're not a technologist, just talk about how you how you looked at opportunities maybe differently than people who were technologists, or how you filled all those gaps in your in your skill set. So, so actually, um, a founder came to see me the other day, and he had read my book. And he said, Dave, I'm the smartest guy at the table, and I want to be the dumbest guy at the table. And I said to him, Darren, I said, yeah, I wrote, I wrote that title with tongue in cheek because in one slither of a company, I actually probably was the smartest guy. I, I was very, very good at selling, and, uh, and, uh, and I think probably the smartest thing I actually realized when I was 26 years old was, yeah, in any company, you need salespeople, you need admin people, and you need technical people. And uh, I knew there were some areas when you say, um, then I wasn't a technologist, and I can absolutely categorically say that, you know, uh, 36 years later, I'm still not a technologist. So I always say, if I, when I change a plug at home, my wife takes the family out, so in case I blow the, the family out. Uh, so, so I, uh, I, I think the smartest thing I did was I recognised that there were some things I would never ever be able to do, no matter how many technical training courses I went on, I'd never ever be able to install or support a, a customer and enterprise network. I'm an accountant by profession, I knew if I had to do the books I could do them, but I didn't really want to do the books, I wanted to focus on sales and marketing, so I said I'm going to surround myself with people in those areas that I will never ever be able to do. And, and with people in those areas that I can do, but I don't want to do so that I can focus on, on what I'm really good at. And I think one of the biggest challenges uh, that any founder has, like I always say, to grow, you have to let go. You, you have to be willing to trust people when you, you know, when you do bring on people into your organisation. You have to be willing to say, you know, if, if Kian's a, a, a business, B2B sales expert, I have to trust him until there's not, until there's, a, yeah, I always trust everyone until there's no reason to trust that person. But if I've got to go and tell Kian exactly what he's got to do, how he's got to do his job, I've hired the wrong person. You've got to empower people and, and that's what creates, yeah, allows businesses to grow, what encourages people to say, I'm, I'm an important part of this organisation, my input is valued. So, yeah, once again, as Kian said earlier on, when he, when he introduced me, he said, uh, I've hired hundreds of people I, you know, over my career and what I've realised is that if you pay people well, if they love coming to, do, to work every day and they have a say in what they do, you can still be part of something great. And really, where did I learn that amazing bit of business management or, or HR management? I learned it from my first boss. I learned it from my first boss because I was paid badly, I had no job satisfaction and I had no say in what I did. So I figured if I didn't like that, there's not one person in this room that want to work in an organisation where you felt you weren't being paid a market-related salary, you, you, you hated coming to work because the culture of the company was toxic, and that nobody wanted to listen to valuable ideas that you had, and that's how, built, that's how pretty much built the culture in our organisation. Towards the end of the book, there's something you talked about which felt quite poignant to me. You were sort of saying, I almost wish I hadn't sold out when I did because so much of my identity and my friendships and things were wrapped up in the book, uh, sorry, in the, in the business and then you were kind of like, okay, what do I do now? So if you fast forward to, to building our innovation fund, yep. what, was the, what was the catalyst for that and what is it that you love about sort of working with founders and startups? I'm just really interested in that. So, so I, I really believe that everybody wants to wake up in the morning and have a purpose. You know, no matter what that is, everybody wants to make a, a contribution no matter what that happens to be. And, and for me, what I found after selling my business, my purpose became mentoring founders and adding value. That if I went and said to a founder, have you tried this or have you thought of that? And, and, and that founder said, gee, I never thought of that. I thought, I've done something today. I've made a difference. And, uh, and uh, yeah, if I, if I, made a massive mistake and, and I've made lots and lots of mistakes. In fact, someone once said to me, Dave, you made so many bad business decisions. And uh, I thought about it and I thought, luckily the few good ones I made outweighed all the bad ones. And, and it really gave me a lot of consolation when I read Frank Lowy's book. And uh, 
many of you probably aren't aware that I think it was in the late 80s, um, the, the Lowry family um, bought um, Channel 10. And uh, it was an absolute disaster. Similar time to where Alan Bond bought Channel 9 from uh, Kerry Packer. And uh, both of them, you know, Kerry Pack was famous for saying you only get one Alan Bond in your life because he went back and bought, bought the company for a fraction of the price of what he sold it for. And uh, the Lowy family, the Channel 10 went into liquidation and uh, they asked Frank Lowy, they said, do you regret buying Channel 10? He said, if I didn't take a risk, he said, I'd still be selling salami in Blacktown. And I think that's what business is about. It's about taking calculated risks and some are going to work and, and some may not. And uh, so, but um, I, I think, so, so what happened was, I really believe I saw the internet really, probably my example I'm going to give, probably not appropriate at, at, at Macquarie University, because I remember saying to my wife in about 1995 and 1996, I saw the internet really, really early on. I was, I was the first Netscape distributor in the whole world. And I said to my wife, our kids will go to Harvard living in Dover Heights. So, as I said, that was before Macquarie had an incubator and amazing facilities you've got today. <laughs> but, but, but I really saw what the power of the internet could be, would bring. But in 1996, um, we had about 240 people working in our organisation, and that was over a nine-year period, and it was really manageable growth. And, uh, and one of my strengths was I really believe I, yeah, I knew every single person in that company in, in a lot of the cases, I knew their partners' names, I knew their kids, I knew a lot of things about people. That was my, my strength and what I brought to the table. And uh, in 1997, we opened up, at the end of 96, we started a new division. It was a professional services business. And we grew from 240 people to about 1,200 people in a year. And, uh, and uh, that growth really, really was, was challenging. And uh, in 2000, I was burnt out, sold the company, and uh, I left in 2001. And pretty much did nothing with the internet. I, uh, and uh, having dabbled in startups since 2000, uh, and uh, in about 2016, having been involved, maybe in about 20 different startups, but more as a mentor, as a, as a tiny, tiny little investor, um, I thought I, I flew to it once in my life. My job is to keep the cash I made, not to think this was easy, I could easily do it again. I, I placed tiny, tiny little bets, and when I could sell, I sold. And, uh, but in 2016, I said to my business partner, I said, you can see what's happening in the startup world in Australia today. And I said, I don't want to make the same mistake I made with the internet. I don't want to come back in 10 years' time when you see the phenomenal success that Australia has had and we still did nothing. Yep. And in 2016, we set up a venture capital fund and I'm really, really pleased we have because it's just unbelievable. I cannot believe how quickly, I think the Turnbull government had did an unbelievable job of, of yeah, I think Malcolm Turnbull came out with you know, innovation as one of his pillars of, of, of government at the time. He made a couple of changes to the tax regulation and all of a sudden the, the, the money in venture capital went from about $100 million so if you were a start, startup, you were literally, you, know, you would be struggling with every other startup for that tiny little pool of capital. Today, I reckon there's about two and a half to three billion dollars worth of capital in the ecosystem. And if you're a decent founder with a, you know, with a pretty decent idea, your know, capital should be the easy, I don't want to say that nothing's easy when you run your own business, but definitely a whole lot easier than what it would have been yeah, five or six years ago, and uh, yeah, I think everybody looks at the canvas, the Atlassians, the um, yeah, the afterpays. But yeah, you know, I just see so many amazing companies. Some of them may never get to unicorn status, but we just had an exit. One of our one of our portfolio companies was sold. A company called EFT Sure um, uh, was sold for a hundred million dollars. The founder ended up with you know with twenty four million dollars. There were two other founders who would have got. Yeah, a, a really decent chunk of capital. We as investors are returning. So when I look at a venture capital fund, I look at, I look at them and say we've got, we've got two, two customers. One of them is the founder on the one hand, and the other, on the other side we've got a fund, an investor, who's entrusted us with their capital, and we, we have got to deliver them a return on their capital. Yeah. And, uh, and how do we keep those two, those two customers happy? And, uh, and by the way, I always say to every person who's investing in our fund, I would rather make 
five times with an unbelievably happy founder than say we made seven times and boy did we screw the founder because I know how tough it is to run, to run your own business. And uh, so we returned, uh, you know, on that single investment, we returned half an investor's um, capital. So if someone had given us $100 just on that one investment, we have, we have um, about 11 in that fund, you've got half your money back. So, so everybody in that ecosystem, the, you know, staff who were given stock options, founders, investors have done well. If you, got, if you start looking at what's happening in the ecosystem, you know, there's, there's people who, who work for Afterpay, people who work for Atlassian, who are now saying, well, I'd love to do yeah. my, I'd like to try my own thing. So there's the whole, this whole flywheel um, of, of an ecosystem in, in ventures is, is happening from, you know, at every level, from a founder point of view, from a, um, an investor point of view, from a staff point of view, and it's, you know, as I will plagiarise, when Malcolm Turnbull did become Prime Minister, he said there's never been a better time to be Australian. And I absolutely believe from an innovation point of view, there's never been a better time to be Australian. <coughs> you covered a lot of ground there. One of the things I'd, I, I think might be interesting for this audience <laughs> is to understand when you and your team look at a startup, it's a kind of an imprecise science in terms of you know, it's a little bit about the founder, it's a little bit about the, you know, the, the product market fit, it's a little bit about the, you know, the size of the opportunity or the competitive landscape. I'm just wondering, could you talk a little bit about some of the different criteria that you personally look at and also maybe the weightings in terms of, you know, which ones do you prioritise? Yeah, so, look, I can only talk about our venture capital fund or, or I'll talk about myself pre our VC fund and now with the VC fund. To me, it's all about it's all about the founder. You know, it's uh, you know, I uh, I meet the founder and say, is this someone that I want to work with? Is this someone? And it should be it should be the same. On, you know, from a founder's point of view, they should be looking at investors and saying, is is this someone? And you know, my rule of thumb is, if am I going out to this person for a beer because I have to or because I want to? And uh, you know, the first thing we look at is the founder. And the second thing is we look at what is the opportunity. And, uh, and then obviously we look at, yeah, we've, we've got a limited resource pool of capital and we want to then make sure we, we deploy that capital to give ourselves the best chance of, of getting a good return for our investors. So you know, we'll look at you know, what's the opportunity, how big can this get? And, uh, but first and foremost, from my perspective, is this a founder that we want to work with? Is this a founder that we believe will be able to yeah, accept the challenges that, that a startup is going to present, and that's not only just a startup. You know, there's different different challenges that you have. You know, from being a startup when you've got you know three or four of you working in a room to when the company's successful, there's you know a hundred people, and then three hundred people. Will you be able to scale? Yeah. And you know, often you go in a little bit of a gut feel decision, and. Uh, and, uh, and that's, yeah, that's pretty much what we would look at. Okay. I've got a couple more questions that I'm going to open up to, to, to the room. So if you have questions, now's a good time to think about them. <clears throat> I've heard you talk today about partnerships and you talked about it a lot in the book. Could you, could you maybe just spend a minute sharing with the team? Because when you're running a big company, it's easy to understand how to create you know, strategic partnerships. But when you're a startup and it's you and your mate or your early stages, it's, it's a big conceptual leap to think, well, what? partnerships would be appropriate or how do we explore who would care, who would want to partner with us you know in our earth just can you just talk about the value of partnerships so, so partnerships are not just those business partnership partnerships are your business partner mm -hmm. yeah partner you know, choosing the right co-founder is a partnership it's it's getting married you know, you you yeah you, know, you say I'm a I'm a sales uh, founder and I'm bringing the tech founder how are you going to work together um, business partnerships yeah, sometimes I, I yeah I, I'm sometimes skeptical of business partnership. I'm going to take EFT Sure for example. Um, we actually help them build a partnership with PwC, and often partnerships are you know, people clink champagne glasses on the twentieth floor at Barangaroo, and absolutely nothing yep. happens. You would know this from B two B selling. Yep. Yeah, the only thing that counts is actually what happens on the street, and that was a partnership that actually made that organisation. I mean, it really helped because. EFT Sure was selling a type of cyber security uh, product 
and having PwC as a business partner recommending it to their clients yeah. made a massive difference for a small company. So yeah, being a founder, you, you, have to, you have to be able to sell. You have to be able to sell whether you going to be, you know, it's unbelievably in my career, and, uh, and unfortunately my career spans a long, long period of time. I would say this is the toughest time that I've ever seen it to attract and retain amazingly good people. Yeah. So as, as a founder, you have to be a bloody good salesperson to, to bring in the right people, to bring in the right, to, to, to make sure you can build those partnerships. You have to, you have to convince a price waterhouse, a big, you know, a lend lease, for example, to say, we are going to add value to your business. You can add value to our business. And, and, and over here, I talk about you know, what is a good partnership. A good partnership, in my opinion, is take a triangle, draw a line down the middle, and as long as those two triangles are balanced, both parties feel they're bringing something to the table. And, and I think it's really important that you are able to really clearly articulate to a partner what value will you be bringing to their business. So if you went and took that EFT sure example, the, the absolute yeah, PwC going to lend lease as an example and saying we think that this would be a really good way for you to prevent fraud in your in your in your payments uh, 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 area is a massive massive endorsement. That's the value that PwC is going to add to EFT Sure. What value will EFT Sure bring to the table? So you have to clearly think. Take that triangle and say, what do I have to do? Yeah, I knew. What did I have to do to convince? Novell, you know, there were 27 companies that were, had applied for the Novell distribution agreement um, when I did. I was in a tiny little office in Erskine Street in the city. And uh, there were public companies who, who tried to get their distribution. I had to convince them and had to sell why I was the right, the right company and the right partner to give, to, to help build their brand in Australia. And, and, and we did. And one of, the, one of the opportunities that it was going to be our sole focus, we were going to absolutely, we were going to live and breathe that product for them. Yeah. And, and we did. <clears throat> Last question for me, and then I'm going to throw it to the audience. And if you ask a question, I'll try and repeat it back just so we get the audio on the video as well. Just a, any other kind of final you know, tips or guidance or war stories for, for, for this group around you know, what, to, what, you know, what to focus on in that, in that first period out of the traps? So... So that's a tough question because there's, there's, there's some, you, you, what I can tell you, you're going to have challenges and, I, and, and they can be, you know, they can be different, they're going to be different along the way. I, I remember, um, I'll never forget going to see a guy, Steve Vamos, Steve's an awesome guy, he, he actually runs Zero in Australia and at the time Steve was running Apple and at that time, believe it or not, Apple was literally going broke um, and, uh, and I'll never forget I went to see Steve and I said, hey Steve, how are you going? And he looked at me and says, Dave, I've had to make shit taste like chocolate for the last two years. <laughs> and, and I think that's your challenge as a founder, that you know, as a founder, you set the tone for your company in every respect. You know, how you treat your staff is the way your management team is going to treat your staff. What, you know, it, I've never seen any company, you know, go to any website, go to any organization, you go and see in there, yeah, in their foyers. I've never seen a, any company philosophy that says, yeah, our number one asset is furniture and fittings, number two is computer equipment, number three is motor vehicles, and number four are our staff. Yeah, everybody says our staff are our number one asset. You, if you're gonna say it, you have to mean it. Your actions are much, much more important than your words. How you treat your customers is the way it pervades the company. When the shit does hit the fan, and I promise you it will, you have to walk with your head up and, and find somebody that you, can, that you can vent to at the end of the day when you're feeling like everything's gone wrong, that you can, but, but if you're looking down and, and dejected, everyone in your company is gonna to look to you and say, Dave's looking dejected, something's wrong. And uh, yeah, you have to be, you, you, you set the time for your organization. Love it, thank you David. All right, let me throw to, uh, to, to the audience. Any <coughs> specific questions or, or comments for, for David? Pop up your hand and we'll, we'll get going. Yep, come to yeah. the back, yep. Yeah. Uh, so David, you know, obviously your company went through this big growth from barely 1,500 people close to the end. 
how do you, I guess, keep, that you said before you were trying to set the tone for your organization, how did you continue to set that tone and you know, keep the personal touch with the organization as you grew that fast and that big? It's a really good question. I think that, yeah, as I say, the tone starts with me and then it, and then it's your management team that you know that you get working with you. And you know, every company should say have some core values that are unbreakable. And what they are you know, in our company, no matter where you work in our company, everybody knew that we loved our staff and we loved our customers. Yeah, those were absolutely rigid, you just could not break those um, those those values. And uh, we made sure that as we grew, and actually we were lucky enough that most of our management team, you know, what I found was, you know, I never expected the company to get as big as it, as it got. You know, you know, Kian said, uh, you know, talking about you know, some of you have got you know, small businesses, you know, you're way, you way f- you know, from being a unicorn. Never have that as your objective. You know, if your sole objective is to say, I'm going to be the next unicorn in Australia, I reckon you, you, you will probably fail. I reckon if you say, I'm going to build a business that is best in its class in this particular area, like I always say, I never hit the table and said, we are going to be a thousand person company, we're going to be a $500 million company. I, 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 I always said, we're going to take care of our customers, our staff and our business partners or someone else will. And if we do really do that, we, we will probably grow as a consequence. It was never our number one objective, so we're going to be, so I often think you have egg on your face. So, so we just made sure that when people didn't fit the culture, that either they didn't, they didn't last long on their own accord, or we, we, we had to make sure that, that it didn't last long from our perspective, from a management perspective, where people didn't share the values of the company that it was best that they moved on. And yet, the day I printed this book, I, I realized I left out two chapters. And one of them um, was going to be in fact, I have written the two chapters, and I'll share it with you guys pre-release. The one chapter is called, um, Your Number One Asset Is Not a Number. Okay, And really what we made people feel special. We made people feel that they were part, and, and we really did. It didn't matter if you, if you packed a box in our warehouse, if you answered the telephone, if you're our best performing salesperson, we treated everybody as part of a team. And in that chapter, an, uh, an example, and actually one of five examples, and you'll have to buy the book, so I'm not going to tell you what it is, but, but one of the examples I used, how many people watch the movie Invictus? Yeah. I hated when people actually said, uh, said on the movie, the rugby wasn't so good, or what did they expect? I think Matt Damon knew what a bloody <laughs> rugby ball was before the movie, but, but, but what that movie was about was how, how Mandela brilliantly used rugby to unite, you know, I'd almost say Ukrainians and Russians and made them feel part of something special. And uh, in that, uh, there was a scene in that movie where there were these two white security guards um, who were chatting and, and Mandela walks in with his security contingent. His security contingent said to Mandela, when do we get rid of them? And Mandela said, no, no, we, we don't get rid of them. They're going to be part of our contingent. Now the two white security guys are talking. The two guys who would have literally shot Mandela in, the, in, a, in a heartbeat not long before are talking. And the one says to the other, how do you find the new president? And he says, you know, with the old president, talking about the clerk, he says, I was invisible. He said, with, with, with Mr. Mandela, he says, he knows that I like English toffees. And he says, every time he goes to England, he always brings me home a roll of English toffee. And you've now got someone who will literally put his life on the line for somebody because he understood what not being a number was. He knew he liked, for one pound, he changed somebody's perception. And I think a challenge of a founder is you have to make people feel special and understand everybody's different. Yeah, he didn't bring him a crunchy. He brought him a roll of English toffee. Thanks, David. Um, another question? Yep. How has the data analytics changed the venture capital stuff? I, I said 37 years, I'm still not a technologist. <laughs> 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 what is that? I'm judging. <laughs> Look, I, I think uh, 
I think data analytics has just made it easier, for example, from a venture capital uh, from a venture capital perspective to do to do your research and to make sure that you know, what companies say they can do, they can do, and then you, you know, who else is doing it, and uh, yeah, but I think yeah, every year when people talk about what are the big growth areas, the big trends, yeah, I don't want to sit here and tell you I'm an expert in crypto and in whatever, but what I do believe is that digital transformation is going to, is, is, is Permeate, permeating through every single aspect of our business lives, and uh, and data la analytics and machine learning is a critical part of of uh, yeah of digital transformation. That's why in our fund, especially being founder fo uh, focused, we have everything from a cyber security at the one extreme to uh, a company called Bear Cremation, uh, who are digitally transforming the funeral business. The one where we like the burn rate to be high, <laughs> but, um, but but and we have everything in between. So we have construction tech, we have ed tech, we have you know, fintech, and I'd say all of those, every single one of those companies are using data analytics as a tool for their particular parts of the yeah you know, for the for the, the industries that they are addressing. I'll come back to the audience in a second. There was one question I forgot to ask you. I was just consulting my notes there. You have a chapter in the book called To Raise or Not To Raise. And obviously, as a, as a fund that's investing in VCs, on the one hand, you'd have a very clear view on the value of raising. But could you just maybe look at it from the other perspective around it, maybe the challenges or the pitfalls? Um, is there any? So I, I always say, uh, and I think I said in the book, is that the biggest challenge challenge with raising is I always say you, you can't afford to be reckless in either direction. You know, a founder's role should be to say what's what's the optimum amount of capital that I need to be able to get to that next step so that I don't dilute too much today or at the other extent that I'm I'm, I'm going to be reckless by saying yeah I'd really like to raise $2 million, but I don't want to dilute by 20%, so I'll only dilute, I'm only going to raise a million dollars. You know, I've had founders come and say they want to raise $2 million and they're willing to give up 20%, and then they said, but we may take on $4 million, but we, we, we still don't want to dilute more than 20%. So, like, so you tell me the business just went from $10 million valuation to $20 million valuation just because you need, uh, you know, you need that extra funding. So, so I think you've got to find the balance between how much do you need. You know? So yeah, in the book I talk about five key performance indicators of which one of them is profitability and cash flow. Okay? So profitability and cash flow, when I thought about it, but most startups don't generate profits and they're not cash flow positive. And we know that. You know, when we invest in a startup, um, you know, we, we recognize that they're taking money to grow their business. And uh, so what you have to say is, how much money do I need to get to that next raise? You know, how much money do I need so that when I do do my next raise, there's, there's just a huge amount of momentum in the business that was different, that's different today to what I did my last raise. I invested in a, in a company that, uh, this was you know, pre our fund, we did software for fast, um, yeah, um, for, uh, uh, um, like KFC, fast food, uh, fast, fast food yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, outlets, and uh, and uh, yeah, when when we invested, we we're dealing with uh, muffin break, a porter. That's when we put our first money in. We then won KFC, and that changed everything. You know, when we invest in the business, we thought we'd be you know we'd be the right partner for. Yeah, for that second tier fast food outlet. We never thought it would be a product that, you know, that those big companies would, would choose to use us. Right. And you know, they took our company, they took our product, because I mean, when you develop a product, you, you have to get to market. Eventually, you, know, you can't build the perfect product. And, uh, and you know, KFC knew a whole lot more about fast food than we did. Our product went from here to here. So when the company needed more money, and you said, what's changed? Well, we're now dealing with you know, one of the world's biggest brands. Yeah, the next, the next thing, yeah, we had just won Starbucks in China. We had hired uh, an amazing CEO in, in the US. Yeah, 
would we keep putting more capital? Absolutely. You could feel the momentum changing. So, so as a founder, you've got to decide how much do I need to get to that next raise? You know, obviously, it then comes to a point where, you know, I, don't, I don't know how many of you have heard of the term a crossover fund, where you're crossing over from a private company to a public company, and, uh, and, and that's your last round of funding before you go public. And at that stage, you're probably going to be making profits, you're going to be generating your own cash flow. But the, you know, until you're at that point, you say, I need to take on enough money to give myself the best chance of success. I met a founder yesterday as an example, and she came to see me and said, a private equity company wants to buy her whole business, and uh, she'll be a small, tiny part of this, uh, of this, murder, of this bigger company. And, uh, and she asked me about my advice, and uh, you know, my advice to her was she, she's literally three months away from rolling out her product in a company changing uh, you know, retail uh, organization. I could literally put her on the map. Um, it will literally in one deal, she'll double her business. Yeah. And I said to her, I would take on enough capital today to give yourself the best chance of delivering on your existing business, but you cannot afford to screw up this opportunity you've been given. Yeah, it, it's a fast moving consumer good product. You, yeah, it's now you're saying my first order was a thousand units. My first order was a thousand units and I got it off the shelves in a month because I now want to restock, I want to reorder. And you make sure you take on enough capital, you cannot, you've got to err on the side of conservatives doing this. Take, take a little bit extra to make sure you do not screw up. Yeah. You will get that opportunity. For me, I spoke about Novelle, that was a company changing opportunity. Yeah, I remember saying to my wife, yeah, if I was offered $5 million cash to start a networking communications company in 1987 with no Novell distribution agreement or no money and a Novell distribution agreement, take the Novell distribution agreement every time. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and it's the same. You will get a company changing opportunity in your company at some stage. And when you do, you make sure that you, you, you do not screw up on that, that you give yourself the best chance of succeeding. And uh, because it, you, that, that is called company changing for a good reason. Thank you, David. Yes? Yeah, uh, how do you identify risk and how do you manage that risk or are you just really lucky? A bit of both. I mean, I, uh, so coming from, not to be disparaging, but coming from the old school like we do in our day, like I remember when I was at uni, um, I had a professor, who I, who I still remember, Professor McGregor, and he said, um, the biggest mistake that many people make when they're going to their, their own businesses is that they do not even know what it costs them to open the doors every month. And, uh, and I was, you know, that rang in my ears for, you know, from the day I started my company till the day I left. That every single day, I wanted to know what is my break-even point, and, uh, and I, I had a number in my head that said, do I believe I've got a reasonable chance? Yeah, in business, nothing's certain. Yeah, if you tr wait to be 100% certain of the facts, you're never going to run a business. You can never, ever be, no matter how many data analytical uh, analytic guys you have, or no matter how many, what software you're using, there is no formula that says, this is a risk-free yeah. um, opportunity. So in my day, it was absolutely saying, how much do I have to sell every month just to pay the bills? And I always made sure that I kept my costs to a level where I thought I had a reasonable chance of, of, uh, of paying the bills. So I think you do have to, and then luckily, uh, I was lucky enough in a very different business to what you guys are doing. Yeah, I always say, um, I rode on the coattails of successful companies. Yeah, I, I would have given anything to do what you know, the Atlassian guys did or what Canva have done by taking a product that was developed in Australia and building a global brand um, yeah, as, like, as, as they have done. Yeah, mine was the opposite, where you know, when Novell was hot, I was their best partner in Australia. When, my, when Novell died, I became Microsoft's best partner. And it yeah, had its own challenges, by the way, that the more successful those US companies were, uh, yeah, Novell would have four four distributors for the same product. So there were four of us selling this identical product and the only way we could differentiate ourselves was by the people selling and supporting that product. 
as opposed to someone who owns their own IP and their own thing. You control your own destiny, but you have to build your brand. So, yeah, uh, but we did have lucky breaks uh, along the way. I mean, I had the best competitor anyone could absolutely ever wish for. Yeah, there were a public company called Datamatic. I became the second Novell distributor. Novell said to me, um, if after 18 months you're as big as Datamatic, there'll be no change to our distribution policy. Within three months, that's twice the size. And uh, it wasn't because we were that good. It turned out we were. But it was because they were that bad. You know, you know, I, I, I would get a, I would get a, in those days, a post of note, you know, Dave, call Kian. Now, what do you do if you get a little message, an email or something that says, call a customer? What, is there anyone who can tell me what they would do? <laughs> Pick up the phone and call a customer. You call them back. You don't even have to come to Macquarie Union to learn that. Okay. You, you call the customer. I cannot tell you how often customers said, Thank you so much for calling me back. Okay. Yeah. I know that was my, you know, I said I, had, I said I could write a book on lucky breaks and I could tell you more stories when we're running out of time. But, 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 you know, I once bumped this CFO and uh, many years later, maybe five years ago, and said we used to have strategy meetings working out how you guys were getting so much market share. And I said, mate, find your customers back. You may, you may find that. <laughs> that was, um, that, you know, and, but by the way, three months later, Novella appointed two more distributors. So it went from one to two to four. And, uh, and it was bloody tough. But we kept our 70% market share. And I always said we were lucky enough to have Datamatic as a competitor. Mary Cell and PowerTech had Comptech as a competitor. And we made, it, we made it bloody hard for them to compete because we, we had amazing people who delivered exceptional customer service. Folks, I am conscious of time, but is there any last one or two questions we probably have time for? Uh, yes, if I can move. Two more, and, and then we'll wrap. Uh, what, would, what would be your top most advice for someone who's just starting off? Um, what's the suggestions? I think, first of all, I think you, you have to make sure that you're actually solving a problem that somebody actually wants. Yep. And, uh, you know, I think that would be first and foremost, and, and second of all, I'd say, I think sometimes founders make a mistake of trying to build the perfect product. And, uh, and you know, I love the quote, it's in my book, and I can say I love it because it's not mine, it's from Reid Hoffman from LinkedIn, where you know, he says, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. Now, being embarrassed doesn't mean that you're gonna let customers down. Being embarrassed means that you've got a roadmap, Okay, you've got a roadmap, but you know that you can add value to a customer over here, and once you're in market, you know, that customer is going to give you a, a huge amount of valuable feedback by saying, yeah, as KFC did for us, they said, we love your product, but it'd be awesome if you added this, this, and this. And, uh, and so as good as you think your idea is, and as good as your roadmap is, you know, when you get to those customers, you'll get amazing feedback. And uh, yeah, I always say, yeah, if you think about if anyone had the original iPod, um, yeah, somebody gave that original iPod for a present, you'd think, geez, what did I do wrong to offend this person? They've given me a brick, it only holds 900 songs, uh, and the battery lasts about nine months, but it revolutionized the music industry. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's, as I say, make sure that you really are solving the problem, and, uh, and, uh, you can articulate how your product product is going to solve that problem. Okay, thank you, David. And then last last question in the back. It sounds like content was growing significantly on the customer revenues. If you had the same choice in today today's world, would you still be the growth of customer revenue, or would you go for the VC company? Look, if you can build a, a company that doesn't require you know, ads to raise or not to raise. Mm. Okay, so if you, if you build a company that is growing unbelievably quickly and you can build it on your ca own cash flow and you're going to give yourself the best chance of maximizing the opportunity without taking any external capital, don't bring in a VC partner, even if they're as nice as what our fund is. You know, if you can do it yourself, the less, you know, the less variables you put in the mix, the better. So if you, if you can self-fund it, you know, I didn't have to self-fund because as I said, I was bringing in products from the US, I was getting credit terms from 
overseas suppliers, selling it to customers over here and collecting our money quicker than we had to pay our suppliers. So we were able to, it was just that model, but it, it's, it's much harder today to do, you know, the Atlassian guys did do it, but most companies today, uh, especially because, you know, technology can be um, copied that quickly. Yeah, if you, you don't want to give, you don't want to give somebody the opportunity of, of replicating what you've done, raising capital and out spending, out marketing and out developing you. So, but if you can, yeah, fantastic. Um, but if, but as I say, you can't afford to be reckless in either direction. Folks, <coughs> hopefully that was a, that was a good use of an hour of your, of your time, of your day. Um, I, I, you know, I know I learn a lot every time I talk to you, David. Um, I think there will be some drinks and some nibbles here as well, so anyone who wants to stay around, but before that, please just join me in thanking David Chang. Thank you.